Well, hello everyone and welcome to the April edition of the Financial Security for All Community of Practice webinars. We are excited about our topic today. We're gonna to be looking at the national project we've had for several years to gather impact data on the extension outreach education programs that we conduct. That's family resource management, personal finance, consumer economics, and all of those other resources that we have that contribute to quality of life. We're so excited to have this team with us today that's been uh, giving leadership to this project. Um, it's been in the works for several years. I believe there originally was a, a white paper that the group did that is still a very interesting read. And I know several longtime members of this community have had uh, some part in making this project happen. The title of our session today is Lessons Learned from Logic Models Documenting FRM or Family Resource Management Program Impacts. I don't know about you, but I love a good logic model. Um, and we're excited to have with us some people who've been leaders in the financial security for all community for, for a bit. Uh, Maria Pepitas, Elizabeth Kish, and Suzanne Bartholome, who is part of this team, but is so don't look for her on your Zoom window because she is not actually physically present, but has been heavily involved in this project for a long time. So she is here in spirit, I am sure. Uh, thanks for the great introduction. And yes, Suzanne cannot be with us today, but she is planning to watch the video. And here we are, in case you're not sure who's who, um, Maria is here from the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension. I'm Elizabeth Kish from K-State Research and Extension, and Suzanne's at Iowa State University. And Laura, I remember one of the first times we worked together was on a logic model, you and I for the high school financial planning program <laughs> many years ago. So I know you like logic models. So do some of the rest of us. What we're going to do today is talk about where we've we been, what have we learned, and some thoughts about moving forward. And I chose this image because, you know, I'm getting a little bit nostalgic. How long has it been since you were in a room with colleagues at one of those conference tables tripping over the legs and the cords. Um, I just had to put it in. <laughs> so hopefully it won't be too much longer so we can all be in person again. Um, but first, we need to celebrate. And we have a lot to celebrate. We started this journey, I think, 2014, 2015, maybe, with 15, with early conversations. And we have come a long way since then. We have reached um, over a million and a half consumers by educators and trained volunteers between 2017 and 2019. And the, so 2019 would be data that was reported in 2020. And so we have some raw numbers for 2020 data uh, and we'll share, we'll look forward to sharing those at another time when we have had a chance to compile them all. So let we can definitely celebrate that. We um, also, you know, we ask about increased knowledge, intent to change behavior, and changed behavior. And interestingly, you can see that it increases rather than decreases. Um, so maybe we're not all asking the same questions, but I think it's a, a definitely all a win. And we need to celebrate that almost 85,000 consumers in those three years worth of data reported changing some behavior when it comes to their money management. Um, I also want to share, so I mentioned the data is from 2017, 18, and 19. The average number of states that reported each year, each of those three years was 17. The range was 14 to 21. And the high year was 21, obviously, um, reporting 2018 data. So that was the second year we had data collection. Um, 
and some states are able to report some quotes and I have a few here just sort of representative, but I think they represent exactly what we're going for when we think about family resource management programming. Someone who's paying bills on time and setting aside money in emergency fund, which they might not otherwise have been doing. Uh, somebody who's writing their money, they're tracking their money of what they received and what they spent, and it really made it real to them. You know, with our um, electronic means of payment, it, it does sometimes not get real for us, or we lose that connection with actual money. And finally, um, someone who says, this is exactly what I needed, someone to go to with questions that I don't know how to ask anywhere else. And again, that's what extension has historically been someone who can answer those questions for people. So uh, thanks, Elizabeth, for that overview. I am excited about all of that uh, data. That is really tremendous. And um, we should all be proud of what we accomplish uh, with with so few of us out there doing it. So yay to us. So I get to do the little job of talking a little bit about our history, the history of this project, uh, kind of where we've been and, um, and where we're hoping to go. We thought we might uh, do this kind of by looking at a logic model. And so um, if we go to the next slide, we can kind of talk a little bit about um, thinking about why we're even doing this project, kind of what's the situation. And overall, right, we, um, we know that financial capability and financial wellness are really integrated into people's lives. And, um, and if all people have the opportunity to experience health and well-being kind of at all stages of life, you know, we know that financial knowledge and skills are critical. And we are cooperative extension uh, personnel, family resource management personnel are really in a unique position to help people strengthen their financial capability and enhance their well-being. And um, sometimes we're doing programming kind of off on our own and sometimes it's integrated into the programs of our colleagues uh, whether it be youth individuals kind of on the farm out in the community and so we work really hard to partner uh, with, with within our organization but also with partners external to the organization and so despite uh, what we know about its importance for financial well-being and capability. Unfortunately, uh, some of the funding to support family resource management programming ha and those positions have uh, declined over the last year, uh, 20 years or so. And so when we think about um, developing a kind of a logic model for this project, you know, we hoped that um, kind of the two goals would come out of that, right? One is, um, we have a way to document the relevance and impact of what we do in terms of our programming and that um, cooperative extension should be recognized or could be recognized at the federal level as one of the systems that can contribute to health and financial well-being of Americans. And so in order to really reach that project level outcomes, we need to be dedicating resources that support FRM programs, um, as well as kind of collecting the data and helping to aggregate to be able to tell a story at, at all levels, right? The county, state, national level. And so partly then our, um, you know, this kind of sets up the situation situation or the context for why the project started in the first place. And so if you go to the next slide, then we'll start talking a little bit about um, the inputs and the outputs and whatnot. So uh, when we talk about the outcomes, right, kind of what I said uh, in terms of the situation statement is what we're hoping to change in the long term, right? We are hoping that 
um, the conditions change so that we will be elevated and uh, help people better understand what we do and how it fits into the well-being of our communities, our families, our individuals, and even some of the small businesses that we work with. So cooperative extension, family resource management programs, we hope in the long run, right, will will and can report national outcomes annually, that we have the dedicated resources to support that data aggregation, as well as the dedicated resources to support FRM programs uh, and personnel. So those are sort of the condition changes that we're shooting for, I'll just say, right? And I think some of the data that Elizabeth just shared can really help people understand the magnitude of the impact that we could have, that we are having and that we could have. So um, many of you are familiar with logic models. You know, we talk about kind of what's the situation statements, what are the inputs and the activities, the outputs that we do. And so um, this slide kind of outlines what has already been done or is in place. And so you can see our inputs are, are typical, right? They're the extension personnel who are working in family resource management. They're the extension agents, they're the specialists, the regional specialists. It's the um, administrators who help support us. It's those IT marketing staff who help us get the word out about our programs. And even some of our NIFA representatives we, we met uh, recently uh, with, um, with uh, uh, Roger Wren Camp and uh, Michael Gutter and uh, uh, previously um, Susan, I can always, I can never remember how to say her last name, but Staluka, right? Okay, <laughs> Staluka. Um, to let them know a little bit about this project. So they are in the know. Um, we are certainly working with those local boards and volunteers. We have, um, you know, financial resources. The uh, Financial Security for All Community of Practice has donated or contributed uh, a couple thousand dollars, twelve hundred dollars, I think, towards this project to help us print and get the word out. And then over the last five, six years, we've actually developed some resources and um, a briefing paper, you can kind of see this list, right? A briefing paper that kind of outlines what's been going on out there, why this is an issue um, and helps to begin to kind of uh, paint the picture of what cooperative extension and the family resource management personnel were doing, the curriculums we were using, uh, the kind of indicators that we were using. And so one of the other pieces that came out of there were three logic models, right? Three logic models that kind of dealt with different audiences. Some of us are working directly with um, clientele, citizens. Some of us are doing train the trainers and are uh, training volunteers or professionals who are then turning around and working with others. And then some of us are also working with stakeholders and trying to help um, tell the story and engage them in ways that uh, elevate the importance of health and financial uh, capability um, programming. So there are those tools. We collected a, a list of indicators uh, at, at multiple levels, right? Um, from the from the output level, how many people have we served to uh, knowledge level, changes in confidence, changes in uh, behavior, uh, and also kind of long-term impact indicators. So there's a list of indicators out there that uh, have been developed. And then what we did is a crosswalk. So what do we know NIFA is asking at the national level for our for our uh, impact statements? And then how does that relate back to uh, are the indicators that uh, individuals shared with us uh, as potential indicators for our programming? So there are those resources that have been de developed as a result of all of the programming, all the meetings and the, the collaborative effort to, um, to bring tools to those of us within Cooperative Extension who are doing family resource management programming. Um, and we certainly have uh, other uh, resources like technology, students, university resource, our networks, they all help us do what we do. From the output side, uh, 
you know, we have done some of these activities already, like created tools, like have given uh, presentations, have conducted webinars, have have uh, looked at curriculum. We've um, we've uh, done some papers and and presentations. There are things that we still need to do, and so those activities are listed right here. And then in terms of participation, we have been so pleased and have really tried hard to be inclusive uh, to engage the the folks who are doing family resource management work to help build the project, guide the project, provide input into the project. And so um, I, I don't know whether we have an actual number, but there's there's quite a few of uh, extension personnel, personnel who have um, contributed to this and um, uh, and are contributing to uh, working towards conditional um, short and long-term uh, changes in our system to support FRM programming. So, and we have, uh, you know, we have tried to engage and, and certainly consulted financial capability and wellness partners. And um, one of the other things that we have done is uh, reached people through our webinars and presentations and, and use of the tools. So those are some of the inputs and outputs that have occurred that have tried to um, elevate the issue, uh, uh, the issues that we're, that we're addressing, but also il illustrate and elevate the work that is being done um, to continue to support what it is we're trying to do. Next slide. Here is the, the, the master, right? The master, the whole uh, enchilada in terms of the logic model. And this is something we can certainly share. So it includes that situation statement and the inputs and outputs and, and those a short to longer term um, uh, out, outcomes we're looking for. And so this is a tool that we thought that we'd, we, we would use and share to kind of help you better understand kind of the nature and scope of what we've been up to, but also some of the reasons why, right? Why are we doing this? So, so now I want to just shift gears here a little bit and talk um, about what the kinds of things that we have learned, right? Um, and so this has been a collaborative project and um, uh, as uh, Elizabeth said, we kind of started in 2015 at uh, AFCPE, our little round table to kind of gather people's um, ideas and, and just see what the motivation was. Are people really motivated to do something like this? And what evolved then was a whole bunch of um, subsequent meetings where we really engaged people in the conversation to develop some of those tools that I mentioned, the indicator list and the crosswalk and the briefing paper and the logic models. We got lots of input and um, really have appreciated all of that. And, uh, and then we started trying to collect data, right? So in 2017, that was our uh, kind of like, hey, hey, we just finished reporting, uh, gathering the data for 2017. So why don't we just practice and ask people to submit their 2017 data? And so that was early 2018. And, uh, and just see whether our collection tools worked. And, uh, and, and they did, but we also refined them. And, um, and then from there, it just sort of has grown, right? We've, we've done it several times now. And as Elizabeth shared, we're still collecting the 2020 data and trying to kind of put it all together to, to see how 2020 turned out. 2020 was a different year, wasn't it? But we'll see how that, how that comes along. But along the way, if you wouldn't mind uh, advancing, we have uh, learned some lessons and uh, certainly some of those lessons are, are the things here on, on the slide, but we have tried to really be inclusive and bring people along and engage them uh, however they can be, um, however it's comfortable for them to be engaged. And uh, keeping it simple and building in complexity because each of our systems, each of our state systems is a little bit different. And so, you know, who, who makes the decisions about what gets, what data gets collected? How does that get reported? Uh, how does it, uh, 
you know, how, who has the ability to pull the data out, right? And so to actually will be able to report it. How engaged are the agents? You know, how many people are even doing the work, right? So every, every state is a little bit different. And so the approach we have taken is let's keep it simple, right? Even if the very least people can help, could, could report how many workshops they uh, offered, uh, and how many people they reached. If that's the very least they can do, then great. And if you, we can c collect a little bit more information about, you know, are they doing professional development training? How many people are those reaching? Um, are we doing volunteer training? How many people are those reaching? Are we collecting outcome data, right? Then that's great. All of that can be added to the survey tool, the Qualtrics survey tool, uh, that we're that we're using. So we've tried to keep that data collection tool simple, and uh, and yet allow for the complexity of our system. We've tried to set some goals, right, for ourselves in terms of this, you know, kind of this data aggregation project, uh, but also, um, you know, in in terms of engaging people. And so, we wanted to be sure that you know that you know uh, that 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 is part of today too, is to sort of help us think about what the next steps are. And Elizabeth will talk a little bit more about that. And um, and that we also recognize that under that that people have different levels of evaluation uh, confidence, right? The confidence in their ability to do evaluation uh, and and or capability to do it in terms of funding and support and whatnot. And so, given that uh, those differences, um, we have tried to keep it simple and uh, and yet allow for some of the complexity. So, okay, next slide. So some other things that we've learned is that um, uh, that uh, as I mentioned, people have different roles in terms of what they're able to re to collect in terms of data, in terms of um, what gets reported, and then how that information gets aggregated at the state or, or the county level, and whether or not people can have access to it to report out national data. So again, we um, are trying to be flexible in that. But part of our goal, I think, too, in having a, a workshop like this um, and and engaging more of our community of practice and family resource management colleagues is to help elevate the conversations that we need to have with our, um, our the, the, the people who are the keepers of the data, right? Um, we conducted that concept test uh, back in uh, 2017 with, sorry, 2018 with 27 data. And, um, and so, we had some success as you saw. And so part of that success I think has been trying to convene and communicate regularly. If you are not part of that system, please put your name in an email in the uh, in the chat and we will engage you in that, that process so that you can become part of the team. And then like today, we're just trying to disseminate and celebrate those accomplishments. Uh, last two years ago, uh, uh, Elizabeth worked on what we called placemats. And so they were just, you know, sheets of paper that kind of looked like a placemat size and it kind of showed some of our uh, outputs and outcomes. And um, and uh, this past year, we did an infographic, kind of a two-page infographic. And so that is something that we can certainly share with you if you've not seen that before. And uh, to kind of um, uh, tell the story and share it with our colleagues and our administrators and our uh, community decision makers um, so that they have a sense of how we fit into the bigger picture. Because I think that's important too. And this is one of the biggest lessons learned. It really takes all of us. And we have a really neat and uh, wonderful uh, network of amazing professionals who are all doing whatever they can do. And so I'm seeing uh, two new names in the chat box. I'm so excited. Um, so please feel free to, to share your email. We will be glad to incorporate you into this network. Um, they're, we're all working together to make things happen. So uh, we won't be recognized, right, until um, until 
we have some rigorous evidence uh, documenting our work. Unfortunately, and, and this is one of the drivers, right? Unfortunately, some of the research out there and even the, the meta-analysis is looking at, you know, how effective is financial literacy education? And it's, some of it's saying it is, some of it's saying, well, maybe it is, and some of it's saying, no, it's not at all. And so, what we noticed when we looked at the literature is that they're not they're not they're not asking extension and we know we know we do good work right and so what we're trying to figure out next is what can we do what can extension do and the family resource management personnel do to begin to be recognized right as part of that national global dialogue about the effectiveness of programming right and so this is, uh, this is certainly one of the things that um, kind of warrants further discussion and conversation and in terms of what our next steps are. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Elizabeth. I guess I set the stage, right, um, for moving forward. What do we do next, right? Definitely. Um, and I guess I we we want to say at this point that the last slide was an observation that we're we're not at the table we're not our work is not being included. I think moving forward the question becomes is that a goal of ours? And for some of us it is, for others it might not be, but it's definitely part of the conversation that we would like to have. Start today and then continue. So, um, but you know, let's think back to 2015, if we can, when this um, project, when we first started talking about, well, can we do this? You know, we thought we could based on history of other efforts that we had banded together within our FRM network. We, we knew we probably could. So we talked about how it should look and all of those things. And as we've changed within the FRM world, so have policies, systems, and environment in the broader world and within extension. So if you're not aware, you know, there used to be Healthy People 2020. They've released Healthy People 2030. And there are actually now objectives that relate to settings and systems and social determinants of health. I mean, there are many other objectives, but those are the two kind of large areas I feel that relate to our work. And so some examples of objectives that we, our work can feed into are, for example, increase the proportion of people with health insurance. I mean, that's kind of a no brainer. A lot of us have been working in the health insurance area. Reduce the proportion of people who can't get prescription medicine when they need them. So again, this is at the intersection between health and financial wellness. And can you adhere to medical recommendations? Do you have the, the skills? Do you, can you manage your money? Are you able to access other resources that you may have available to you so that you can do that? And then also, you know, um, a lot of us in different times have we work with lower resource people, lower income audiences. And for a while we were helping people, um, you know, connect to the labor market. So one of the objectives in Healthy People 2030 relates to employment, increased employment in working age people. We've done that. We continue to work in that area. So just want to, you know, we we relate to this dialogue. We, we can contribute, but people don't necessarily think of us directly. The other thing that's changed is there's a new um, ECOP task force called the Health Innovation Task Force. And this um, is really, I was reading a report, so they frame it as a platform um, to think and work innovatively, right, on a variety of topics, but they're using health as kind of a test case. And then they're also updating the framework for health with a future focus. And so those who were able to be on um, a couple weeks ago, the community of practice meeting, this is uh, Michael Gutter and Roger Redenkamp. Uh, Maria mentioned that they talked to us, and this is a draft still of um, what will eventually some form, I believe, will um, become the uh, new model for extension. And the 
and those of you who are on, correct me because the the key to the different colors is not there. But the blue is the outcome that we're going for: health equity. Right? Every person has a fair and just opportunity to achieve optimal health. The green is what extension does, and who and how we approach our work. Um, the orangish, goldish are the social determinants of health. And if you remember the previous iteration of this framework, the initial framework, we were sort of there when it came to health insurance, but not the broader resource management aspects. So we, we show up actually, I mean, we can find our place, let's put it that way, in many of these social determinants of health. And then the, the outer ring is values, beliefs, norms, policies, and practices. And so um, this is new. And this is where a lot of our FC family and consumer sciences or health and human sciences, whatever your state calls that subject, <laughs> broader subject matter discipline. This is where a lot of our states are moving. And so um, we can be part of those conversations and we can contribute to that work. So then what are some of those opportunities for us? Well, we kind of looked at them was what can we do locally and what can we all do together? So locally, and Maria um, alluded to this, is we can help our colleagues understand how family resource management, personal finance, family and consumer economics, whatever it's called in your state, how we really can integrate. We are one of the puzzle pieces for many other program areas, whether it be youth, nutrition education, um, farm family education, community vitality. We have a role for all of those. Also, talk with our administrators. Ask, especially this gets back to understanding where as individual extension professionals, we fit within our state systems in terms of data and reporting. And just ask, how can you better capture and report um, the data that you're generating related to family resource management? As a group, we can speak and elevate this work and relate it to national efforts, such as what's going, what's happening already with health extension, what's going to continue in that direction. And then, you know, hopefully we want to provide um, language or a framework or a framing so that all of us can justify doing programming at this overlap or intersection of health and financial well being. Because again, you know, financial well-being is, that's an outcome and health is an outcome, right? So that's really what we're headed for. It's great to be able to manage our money, but why? So this is really the why. What what do we want to get um, for us uh, as individuals managing our own money and our own financial well-being and health, as well as the members of our community? So um, we are at a crossroads, though. You, you know, we pre presented data. We had people report data for 2020. Um, but the number of states who report it is flexible. It, come, it ups and downs for a lot of different reasons. My goal has always been at least 50% of states. So we haven't ever quite reached 25. So um, that's still a goal. Um, but I think if we can do over 20 in a year, that's that's pretty good. Um, but, you know, they, we also could have some other destinations. We can keep on doing this, what we've been doing, and we will, as long as states continue to report. But is there more? What else, given that the environment has changed? So we're, we're going to start this discussion today and then um, hopefully have some consensus and movement, you know, a plan to move forward in early 2022. So we, um, these are some potential destinations and goals that Maria and Suzanne and I came up with. Um, they are, um, can be mutually exclusive, but they could be, they could all be important goals, right? So maintain the viability of FRM as a program area it could be one of our goals. National programming locally implemented could be another. We've at different times talked about, are we ready to entertain serious discussion about might not be all the programming that is done in a particular state in this area, but perhaps we say we're going to at least do this program in as many states as possible. Are we ready to really talk about curriculum that meets strict standards as an evidence-based program? Um, you know, some of the other subject matters within extension um, have programs like that. We 
are a little bit light in that area, although there are some that um, could be selected. And then finally, I guess, and this is maybe really uh, uh, the open question, is do we want to be recognized at the federal level as one of the systems that contributes to financial security of Americans? And if so, then we have some work to do. Um, if not, maybe those of us who do feel it's important will continue on that way. But um, so anyway, I don't want to <laughs> but um, if if the idea is so sort of just picking, uh, um, identifying one of these, if we decide that the destination is use of an evidence-based curriculum, there are still many possibilities. So, for example, does everybody use a single curriculum or do we perhaps select from a menu? Do we establish our own evidence-based curriculum by identifying from existing curricula and um, going through the process of getting it recognized. And there is actually um, a process for that. Suzanne it reads, uh, is so, has searches, is so um, familiar with the wider literature, let's say it that way, that she's always coming up with, okay, well, we could do it this way. And there's literature on that. Um, or do we develop one on our own? Um, and then the, another way to think about it is, do we go it on our own? just within cooperative extension, or do we actively seek partnerships um, from other national organizations? Some people have been involved with the CFPB and the um, Your Money, Your Goals efforts. Others have done housing counseling. So those are just the two. I mean, we in the past, we've been involved with the high school financial planning program, which is going away. So, um, so those are some ideas. So we just have a, a few next steps. Um, we, we encourage you to talk with F your FRM colleagues in your state, as well as others. I mean, talk to your administrators, talk to your whomever your leaders are in extension and just, you know, what are their plans for going forward um, in this subject matter? Be part of this continuing conversation. Uh, we're going to avidly, I can't see the comments, so I'm looking forward to seeing a transcript. Um, and then connect with us, uh, Suzanne, Maria, and me, to share your ideas or learn more. Um, here we are again, but really we want to say special thanks to all the FRM professionals who've already contributed to this initiative and who will contribute um, going forward. And then um, I've just learned about these wonderful free slide templates. And so this is their credit slide. So we'll leave that there.